invite uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise to address this chamber on Bill C-56, and specifically its amendments to the Competition Act. So that's the regime that enables the Competition Bureau to protect our economy from actors and acts that would unduly and artificially increase prices and decrease product choice for consumers. An empowered Competition Bureau means a Canadian marketplace that is more innovative, efficient, and most importantly, affordable. In my home province of New Brunswick, Madam Speaker, in particular, where household inco incomes on average are, are lower than the rest of the country, we need to do, use every tool at our disposal to bring down food prices for Canadians and their families. This series of proposals, enclosed in Bill C-56, may be part of the response to a global inflation crisis driving up the cost for Canadian necessities, but it's also a long-awaited package that will better align our competition framework with international be best practices. The bill includes three significant changes to the Competition Act the abolition of the efficiencies exception in merger review, the ability to compel information during a market study, and the ability to review agreements between non-competing actors that are designed to reduce competition. The efficiencies exception, a defense that allows anti-competitive mergers to survive a challenge if the corporate efficiencies it is expected to generate are greater than the harm to competition, is unique among advanced competitive regimes. It allows a merger to proceed, knowing full well that consumers may pay higher prices to help the merging companies save costs. The European Commission, one of the most active and visible competition authorities around, does not treat efficiencies in this manner. Our European counterparts will only consider efficiencies as relevant when those efficiencies are likely to benefit consumers. They never rely on corporate efficiencies to justify an anti-competitive merger. In Australia, the law itself does not list efficiencies as a factor con to consider in deciding a merger cases. In fact, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has published guidelines stating that it will not clear anti-competitive mergers even if the new firm would enjoy a lower cost structure. Of course, the comparison often used, given our proximity, is the United States. The courts in our neighboring jurisdiction have specifically ruled that possible corporate efficiencies from a merger cannot be used as a defense to justify an anti-competitive merger. Efficiencies must be pro-competitive and pass through in some capacity to the marketplace, not just the merging companies. The way this, in this way, Canada is out of step is illustrated perfectly by the fact that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has successfully challenged a Canadian merger that our own Competition Bureau could not because of claimed efficiencies. For example, when Superior Plus Corp was going to acquire Conexus in 2016, the Bureau found that the competition, the competition would suffer materially in a number of markets. It predicted a lack of remaining competition and higher prices for consumers. Nevertheless, because of the provision in the Competition Act, the Bureau had no choice but to refrain from challenging the transaction, as the efficiency gains could, could be shown to outweigh the anti-competitive impacts. With no similar constraint, the United States Federal Trade Commission mounted a challenge because of what would be the resulting high rate of concentration in the sodium chlorate market. It also found evidence of the acquiring party's desire to restrict output post-merger, an increased ability to collaborate with competitors, and its desire to neutralize Conexus as a disruptive lower price alternative. Without even delving into the important question of whether promised efficiencies are ever delivered, it should be clear that this defense can lead to detrimental effects on competition. It's about time that Canada joined the rest of the world in putting competition first. I'd like to now speak specifically about the market study powers. Our current market study framework is another area where we are out of step. The Bureau can periodically study industries to better understand their competitive dynamics and make recommendations to government, like the retail grocery market study that it released last June. However, the Bureau has no means to compel parties to provide any information and instead relies on voluntary submissions, public data, or information they already happen to have. This is not the case in comparable jurisdictions once again. In the United States, the Federal Trade Commission has the authority to demand a compulsory special report that answers specific questions about an organization's business, conduct, practices, management, and relationship to other parties. The European Commission can conduct studies into sectors or agreements across various sectors and can request necessary information or carry out inspections. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission can also ask the Treasurer to instigate a price inquiry that allows authorities to access information on a wide variety of topics. All of the above jurisdictions have serious sanctions for failure to comply, ranging from the ability for the enforcer to conduct a much wider study to fines based on the company's annual turnover. Moreover, these studies have proven to be a valuable tool for market insight. The USFTC, when faced with the novel problem of serial acquisitions by dominant tech platforms, 
launched its version of a market study to compel information on relevant mergers. Similarly, the United Kingdom's Competition and Market Authority in 2022 concluded a market study in the music and streaming industry to better understand why there had been a 40% revenue drop over 20 years. The retail grocery code that is currently in effect in the UK is also the direct result of recommendations by the Competition Authority after a detailed market study. The Government of Australia, in response to ballooning electricity prices, ordered a price inquiry that resulted in a series of high-impact recommendations to government, many of which were directly related to enhancing competition. Canada has had five market studies since 2007. Retail grocery, digital healthcare, financial technology, self-regulated professions, and the generic drug sector. Were the Bureau empowered with the ability to compel information from reluctant companies, it is not difficult to imagine just how much more fruitful these studies really could have been. Lastly, the third reform in this bill concerns agreements in restraint of competition that are made between parties who are not competitors. Sometimes this is called vertical collaborations. This has been identified as an issue relevant to restrictive clauses made between commercial landlords and supermarket tenants to keep grocery competitors out of the property limiting competition. The Competition Act has a number of provisions that could apply to some vertical collaborations, but will not necessarily if the specific facts don't quite, up, quite line up perfectly with the statute. Its most basic provision on anti-competitive collaborations, meanwhile, is limited to those between real or potential competitors or horizontal collaborations. Once again, Madam Speaker, we are the outlier in this approach. Our peers in the United States, Europe, and Australia can examine vertical agreements that limit competition, such as by restricting distribution channels or territories of operation. In one notable case, the United States Department of Justice or challenged Visa and MasterCard for their contract terms with merchants that limited consumer options. When our own Competition Bureau tried to mount a similar case, the limits of the Competition Act meant it was forced to bring the case under an ill-suited provision, provision and it lost. The Competition Tribunal could not issue an order, even though it recognized the competitive harm. It was a valuable lesson in the importance of a modern legal framework that reflects how today's marketplace operates. We have seen that it is time for Canada to join the club, so to speak, and emulate the best practices of our peers. This is why, Madam Speaker, I encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting this bill's passage. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Case to ask the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I really appreciate it. My colleague, and let me congratulate her here on the floor of the House of Commons on her expanding role of having started in a different political party and now moving over to the new political party and actually getting a parliamentary secretary position. So she, her, her trajectory is clearly on the rise here, and I congratulate her for that. Uh, there is a, a life in politics, obviously, that requires a lot of advancements of those kinds of sorts. But let me ask her clearly if she thinks that advancing this legislation through Parliament and would be better served if she actually paid attention to the bill that was being brought forward here, rather than just trying to reinvent a new bill that, if she was actually serious about it, like her party should have been serious about it, would have been in the budget last year. Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Colleague for your question and your kind words. Um, I certainly paid attention. I, I paid attention to all the happenings in this House. Um, and I mean, we, consultations began on this quite some time ago, and so I think it's important to look at the process when we bring in legislation and, and involving multiple provinces and territories, conversations with retailers, and everyone who's going to be involved in, in what we're trying to achieve here. And so um, I think, you know, there's, there's never a, a better time um, to put forward legislation, and I'm glad that we're certainly stepping up and acting, because as we've clearly stated in this House, affordability, grocery prices are what we're hearing from all of our constituents, and like I said, we have to use every tool at our disposal. So I'm happy to see the legislation now, um, and again, those consultations began quite some time ago. Thank you. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député d'Abitibi, Témiscamingue. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Dans un projet de loi qui parle de pouvoir abolir la TPS sur la construction de logements, il y aurait un principe évident à ça, c'est-à-dire que ça va baisser de façon évidente le prix des loyers, des locataires actuels qui ont de la misère à joindre les deux bouts. Et on est dans une crise à travers tout le Canada, tout le Québec, Madame la Présidente. En Abitibi-Témiscamingue, se loger coûte à peu près aussi cher qu'à Montréal. On ne se trompe pas, là. En quoi, réellement, ça va faire baisser le prix des logements Actuel, si on empêche, la, si on abolit la TPS sur la construction de nouveaux logements. Ça ne prendrait pas une solution de ce côté-là pour être capable de réglementer ou de faire baisser le tarif? Merci, Madame la Présidente. L'honorable secrétaire parlementaire. 
Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci à mon collègue pour son question. Um, I mean, we're already hearing from developers across the country about how this is going to incentivize them to really increase that stock and supply. Um, that's the biggest thing I think we can do right now on the federal side of things to, to look at those rising costs for, for rent uh, and for homes. Um, it's, it's specifically an issue in, in my riding as it is for every member of this house. Um, and I've, I've had these conversations with developers and so they're looking for, for tools, they're looking for that support from the government and this is one I think really important measure that can help again with that densification, increasing that stock and that's the biggest thing that we can do to bring down prices. It's not going to happen overnight but we're, we're working as fast as we can. Thank you. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Courtney Alberney. I want to thank my colleague for her speech and congratulate her as well on her new role. Uh, we've heard the Conservatives talk about selling off 15% of private lands and 6,000 government buildings. We saw what happened at the Greenbelt with the Conservatives in Ontario. We saw what happened in British Columbia to private forest lands. Basically, it ends up in the hands of developers and it doesn't create any affordable housing. So what I want to know, Madam Speaker, is will my colleague look at creating legislation so that all federal buildings and lands that are used for affordable housing aren't sold but actually leased or transferred back to the Indigenous peoples whose lands we sit on. Because I, I, I want to make sure, Madam Speaker, that it doesn't end up in the hands and profiteering for developers. And we know that the private sector has never solved an affordable housing crisis, ever. We need non-market housing. We need to work together on that. Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague uh, for that very important question. Um, I mean, it's, there's a com combination of things. Again, this is a multifaceted issue that's impacting Canadians right across the country. We absolutely have to look at the, the, the non-market rentals. We have to look at, you know, ensuring that we're looking at models like co-ops. We have to look at every available tool that we have. Um, but the private sector does have a role to play. Um, I know that there's, there's certainly, you know, lots of vilifying of developers that's happening, but I, I, I point to some examples in my home writing. Uh, we have an incredible developer. His name is Marcel Lebrun, and he's been integral in putting forward really inclusive uh, ways and, and in creative ways to deal with our housing crisis. And so, um, you know, it's going to take a combination, and I think we certainly need to bring the developers into that conversation while protecting those um, who will be, you know, impacted by housing the crisis in the country. Thank you. Questions et commentaires? Une dernière question, the Honourable Member for Brampton East. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Brampton North. Um, but my question to the member is uh, that we see in this piece of legislation that uh, there will be amendments uh, that are made to the Act to bring business mergers that, are anti, that have anti-competitive effects um, that will stop big business mergers, sorry, that with anti-competitive effects. And I wanted to know um, what the member thinks, uh, what kind of uh, benefits this could ha have in her community when it comes to small businesses and especially small grocers. General Parliament Secretary, 20 seconds. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the, uh, my honourable colleague for that question. Uh, I come from a province that is very familiar with corporate capture and what can happen when you don't have a competitive market, especially to protect those smaller retailers and, and grocers in particular. We're having this conversation. Um, and so competition is always better. Um, and I think that this is a, is a really big step forward and, and, again, bringing us in line with some of our other nations as well.